First, let me tell you what a joy it is for me to participate in this exciting conference at this excellent university in Brazil, even virtually, if not in person, and even in English, if not in Portuguese. I can read Portuguese and can understand bro spoken Brazilian Portuguese fairly well. I often communicate with Brazilian speaking Brazilians speaking Spanish while they speak Portuguese. But speaking in Portuguese is beyond me. So I will have to speak English. I am honored to have my book translated by Alexandra dos Santos and published in Portuguese by Editoria Voces Limitada. It just appeared last November. Here is the beautiful book cover. First, let me say a few words about it. It is probably the first truly Afro-Atlantic book because it attempts to include all the major times and places of the transatlantic slave trade. And it is even fairly short. The hardest part was conceiving it and figuring out some of the right questions to ask. I can't claim I came up with the right answers. It is only an attempt to do so. That will be the task of my younger colleagues, which includes just about everyone because I am so old. I learned some of the major questions of my work mainly from my Brazilian colleagues. Scholars from the USA and Brazil have learned from each other for more than a century. Gilberto Freire learned from and was inspired by Franz Boas and the greatest voice for racial equality at the time when so-called scientific racism prevailed everywhere. Before he studied with Boas, Freire believed that all the problems of Latin America, including Brazil, stemmed from its darker and mixed blood population, and the only solution was to bring in large numbers of white immigrants and encourage its dark-skinned population to die out and or be absorbed by a large immigrant of racially superior whites. Freire abandoned this consensus of Latin American thought and embraced and popularized the concept that Brazil's greatest strength was the biological and cultural mixture of her population. This was a great positive step at the time he first published, although Freire falsely claimed that African slavery and racism was mild in Brazil and that Portuguese colonization was positive throughout the world by glamorizing the Portuguese male's supposedly unique tendency to create a mixed race population. But Freire's embrace of race mixture in Latin America was an enormous step forward, an interpretation first made by the Mexican philosopher and Minister of Education, Jose Vasconcelos, in his book, La Raza Cosmica. Caribbean scholars have refined these ideas to the concept of creolization as a basis for culture formation as well as of languages in the Caribbean. I brought the concept of creolization to my studies of the formation of cultural colonial Louisiana. 
which has been widely adapted to cultures throughout the United States now. What Africans in colonial Louisiana, the de development of Afro-Creole culture in the 18th century did, is best explained by the nine book prizes it won. The John Hope Franklin Prize, awarded by the American Studies Association in 1993. And I quote, In making its selection of Africans in colonial Louisiana, the committee cited the book's wide range of original research and its certain impact on many fields of American culture. Providing a solid ground for theory in extensive and difficult archival documentation, the book continues work in African American history. Com excuse me, the book combines work in African American history, diaspora and Caribbean culture, anthropology, linguistics, and colonial American history. It opens to view a new transnational conception of the American culture that grew from slavery and from slave resistance and describes a process of creolization whose full effects have perhaps only become apparent, at least to scholars, in the present day. More than any of the more than 100 books submitted to the committee by publishers throughout the country, Africans in colonial Louisiana promises to shape the course of future research in American studies for many years to come. And Africans in colonial Louisiana did exactly that. Yes, indeed. It redefined what American culture is, making us identify as one people. Well, not all of us, but white nationalists are a dying breed. They still believe that the United States is or should be Anglo-Saxon and immigrants and the lesser races should adapt their language and culture right away. But the process of creolization blends the greatest strength of all of our peoples and cultures, including Native Americans, Africans, Europeans, Asians, Mexicans, and Caribbeans. So let me talk a little about how my book, which was just published in Portuguese in Brazil, got started. In 1984, I began to produce the first original digital database in historical studies first published on a CD in 2000 by Louisiana State University Press. It started my data, I started my database after I discovered documents in the Pointe Coupe Parish Courthouse containing rich information about slaves and most surprising, their largely self-identified African ethnicities. At that time, historians and other researchers put research notes on index cards. But I found so much detail in these descriptions of slaves, I quickly found that I needed a more complex tool for collecting and understanding it. I began to construct this database after I discovered, discovered the quantity, richness, and complexity of the information in documents describing thousands of slaves. Personal computers were just coming on the market then and were not exactly easy to use. They did not have enough memory for an operating system or software which had to be inserted on a thick disk and another disk inserted to add memory. Unlike other databases, mine was original digital because the data was entered almost entirely directly from original manuscript documents. It contains a greater variety of African ethnicity designations than any other documents in the Americas. There's extensive data about names, gender, age, racial designations, family relationships, prices, 
skills, illnesses, character as perceived by their masters, and testimony by slaves about running away and their involvement in conspiracies and revolts against slavery. I included all information found about each slave, including what type of document we found them in and where to find it. My team and I databased all documents about slaves through 1820 in archives and courthouses throughout Louisiana, plus information about slave trade voyages coming directly from Africa from archives in France and Spain. The slave database contains over 100,666 descriptions of slaves from documents. The free database contains even more information about over 4,064 slaves who were freed or in process of being freed, including how and why they were freed, by whom, how the slave was related to the freer, the price paid when there was a self-purchase or a purchase by another person to free them, terms and conditions of freedom, and the name, racial designation, and origin of the mother of the freed. In all, there are over 104,000 slave descriptions. One advantage of databases is they can be asked specific questions, and by using statistical package software, calculations, and graphs, questions can be answered quickly and easily. Some can be answered which no one thought to ask because they assumed they could not be answered. With the results of calculations made on these databases often refute speculative conclusions and the collective, quote, wisdom, unquote, passed on by historians who have themselves, excuse me, who base themselves on less reliable, more subjective sources, including views and opinions of travelers and officials who lived way back then. But best of all, they give rich information about the lives of slaves who nobody thought we could have know anything about. Although I created these databases mainly for my own research and writing, I figured they would be used by other scholars and knew they could be helpful to genealogists who could trace their ancestry back to colonial and early colonial and early American times. Thanks to a National Endowment for the Humanities collaborative research contract awarded to me and Patrick Manning, I spent most of the 1990s completing the databases for all of Louisiana through 1820 and preparing them for publication on C, D, compact disc, with the help of a few research assistants I trained. Paul Lachance gave me generous, highly skilled health as usual. He, Ginger, and Jeffrey Gould contributed their beta databases to the CD. I didn't expect my databases to make waves, but a few weeks after my 71st birthday, David Firestone, then one of the two southern regional reporters for the New York Times, came to my shotgun house at 1300 Dante, Dante Street in New Orleans to interview me. Firestone was experienced working with databases and he quickly realized their value and potential. He too had started using databases on personal computers during the 1980s and was teaching other New York Times reporters how to create and use them. He was surprised little attention had been paid to mine, and he asked me if I was surprised or disappointed. I said no, because although it may sound immodest, I am usually at least 20 years ahead of my times, and perhaps if I lived to be 90, I would see my work appreciated. Now that I will be 90 next year, it seems I was right. 
As Firestone walked out the door, he said, we'll see about that. His extensively illustrated article began on the front page of the New York Times on Sunday, July 30, 2000, and continued on most of two inside pages in the national section. An Associated Press story appeared all over the country in large newspapers and small. It contained a photo of me and my dog in my tropical patio in New Orleans. ABC World News, Lifetime Live, and Cable News Network broadcast television stories and interviews. National Public Radio and British Broadcasting Company, World News, did several radio broadcasts. People, People Magazine published a story about me, my family, and the databases. The Journal of the American Bar Association November 2000, published an article feature, featuring Percy Pierre, the great electric engineer on its cover. He had found the ethnicity of his African ancestor on my database before it was published, and he was quoted as saying he wanted reparations. There was a large inside story about the implications of the databases is for African American reparations. It concluded that my database is a major refutation of legal arguments against reparations because now we can identify the specific victims and perpetrators of the enslavement of particular Africans and their descendants and assess concrete damages based on the prices paid for them. I became suddenly, quote, famous, unquote, quote, because my database revealed substantial details about just about every slave who lived in Louisiana between 1719 and 1820. The most frequent question asked me was, are you really 71 years old? Wasn't your age a misprint? Few could believe a 71-year-old woman created a cutting-edge tool in digital humanities. But I had just gotten started. I never believed the consensus that Africans lost their, all their cultural heritage during, during, heritage during the transatlantic Atlantic crossing or shortly thereafter, a hotly debated topic for years. I wanted to know who these Africans were, where they were clustered, and why. I completed and published the English version of my book in 2005, which was just published in Portuguese in Brazil in November 2017. I know this book has serious limitations. I made several proposals to find ways to work collaboratively with the many scholars who were by then creating their own slave databases and find ways to link at least part of them together online. During the last he half decade of 2000, I wrote several unsuccessful proposals which were rejected mainly because I did not have an affiliation with a university capable of doing this. I solved this problem too. In February 2010, I was invited by historian Walter Hawthorne to speak, to speak at Michigan State University. While I was there, I met with Hawthorne and Dean Rayberger, director of Matrix, MSU's Institute for Digital Humanities, where I detailed my plans and proposals to create a universal slave database. I just found my extensive notes and presentations at that meeting, which, which will be available at the Gwendolyn Midlow Hall collection at the Bentley Historical Library, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. I returned to East Lansing on June 1st, 2010, and moved into an apartment I shared with my dearest, oldest friend, Mabel Robinson Williams, widow of Robert Francis Williams, leader of the armed self-defense movement against the Ku Klux Klan, 
in Monroe, North Carolina, and which inspired many other similar movements, especially in the Deep South. I wrote, I wrote a grand proposal when I was 81 years old with help from Walter Hawthorne, Dean Rayberger, and Christine Root to store and link the many databases about individual slaves which sprouted up after mine. It was enthusiastically approved by the National Endowment for the Humanities, but their funding was slashed that year to a pitiful amount. But we did do some important, innovative, collective work. See this link if you want to know more. We started a collaborative, universal, best practices slave database by reaching out to fellow scholars throughout the world with Skype while holding weekly meetings for an entire year with Paul Lachance, Catherine Foley, and me. Catherine wrote an impressive summary of our work in our final report to the National Endowment for the Humanities. I can include a copy if you want. We organized an, an influential conference at MSU in 2013 which brought together some impressive slave, da slave database projects, opening up, opening up future collaborations among their creators. But the project remained at an el elementary stage of programming when I left MSU in late 2014. It was stalled because of lack of funding. Then the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation approached Matrix to help them and some partner projects apply for substantial funding to resume our collaborative database project. Mellon came up with almost one and a half million dollars in January 2018 for 18 months for starters for MSU and some prestigious partners to prove they can create a hub linking individual enslaved people on each other's platforms with promise of an even more funding beyond the initial proof of concept period. I am now optimistic that this ambitious project will succeed. As we continue to develop a best practices slave database to link similar projects throughout the world, millions of African Africans and their descendants who very existence, whose very existence has been denied and or ignored, will join other slaves in cyberspace. I hope my Brazilian colleagues will join us. See this informative website. I used to believe I was a tiny, insignificant clog in the huge wheel of history moving ever forward towards inevitable progress. Now I know better. Progress is made by who People who make ethical choices inspire others to do the same. That is the powerful role of the individual in history. It's the people who do, do what is right because it is the right thing to do and for no other reason who finally win, even though it often takes a long, long time. They rarely get the credit, but that's not why they do it. So let's work together across racial, national, and religious lines to save our world by making a better one. And thank you very much. <laughs>